Greetings and salutations. You are listening to the Into the North podcast, where we take a look at the competitive side of the Commander format, also known as CDH. I am Reed, aka Sick Robot, and today I'm joined by Morgan, aka Spleenface. How's it going, everyone? Uh, and in this episode, uh, we're going to do a uh, requested topic that I think um, we've actually been meaning to do for a while now and sort of found excuses to not do, which is uh, the current meta. Um, and sort of just uh, commenting on it, our thoughts, um, sort of laying out, sort of, I, I would say, like, mostly where it's at right now, um, especially in terms of tournament play, and then just, you know, talking about it, talking about it a bit. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, we, I feel like, uh, at least I've wanted to do this one for, like, oh god, at least, like, a few, oh god, over, probably over, like, half a year at this point. Uh, I sort of wanted to do, like, a mid-year uh, meta recap, but... I like think by the time we started wanting to do it, it was, like, a bit too early in the year, and you, like, you know, you, you don't, you want to, like, give it, like, at least, you know, a quarter and a bit of the year before you do, like, another one from, like, our New Year's episode or whatever, so. <laughs> yeah, and then I think also, like, the last time we sort of talked about it, there were, like, we were sort of heading into a slew of tournaments. Yeah, we so just like, didn't want to, like, Maybe we should do this after, it. and then... Yeah. You know. Turns out, never did it. <laughs> but we're doing it now! Whoops! So, you know. <laughs> um, it's before episode. Um, anything you want to talk about? I I feel like I, unfortunately, have lost the... Uh... <laughs> so, this is. I guess we'll get this out of the way before the episode as well. This was originally recorded as a... Um, well, the original version of this podcast was recorded as a, uh, a live podcast on the uh, Jace, just another CDH event, uh, on the r slash CDH uh, Discord server. Um, and, uh, turns out it was a pretty good episode, uh, Methinks, I thought so, and I think probably some of the listeners there thought so as well. Uh, unfortunately, we lost half of the audio for that episode, so we can't publish it anymore, so we're doing a recording of it now. So if you were, uh, there to witness the original live recording of this episode, uh, might be a bit different, might be not, um, but hopefully we could polish it up a bit, and um, sorry we didn't get any chat interaction in the episode that actually got to publishing. <laughs> Well, you should definitely stay and listen and give us, you know, the the algorithm boost. You know? Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't don't go anywhere. It's a, it's a different episode. This is a completely different episode. So you got to listen all the way through anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, uh, I unfortunately don't get to talk about Vintage Cube because the season has ended. Although I will say, I played a couple of games of uh, the current one, which is the Innistrad Horror Cube currently on the... Uh, on Magic Online, um, and that one is uh, not as good as the Vintage Cube, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I sort of, sort of went in chasing the dragon to be like, surely, surely there will be a cube as good as Vintage Cube, and it's just like, uh, no. I drafted a uh, drafted the zombies deck, and then I got hit by the uh, three mana creature that has white tap just uh, exile target zombie. <laughs> Fun. Not okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love it when there's just a card that invalidates your entire draft deck. Archetype. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was very surprised when I saw it. It was like, oh, oh, that's a thing in this cube. And then it is tried horror cube with zombies as a core archetype. I see. Hmm. All right. <laughs> game Lost that design. Game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything from you, Morgan? Uh, not especially. Yeah. yeah. Was able to just let vintage cube go back into the vault without uh <laughs> yeah i was actually I, withdrawal i was i was like sort of fine with it but i thought i had another day to get like a final draft in and then i went to log in and it's just like oh it's just gone oh, oh, all right <laughs> Guess I'll just go through the stages of grief real quick right in my chair <laughs> um cool so in that case we'll move on to uh housekeeping uh it's always in housekeeping we'd like to give a thanks to any new patrons who signed up uh for this episode and we have one for this episode so thank you to mike m you rock because Lyndon is not going to say that anymore so i have to take up the mantle <laughs> um and we'll talk about it more at the end of the episode but if you too would like to become a patron we have a selection of perks including uh some discord perks for our discord and uh early releases and such so you can go uh check out our uh, patron which is in the uh the link tree in the description below yes we like every other uh podcast ever have <laughs> discord roles available <laughs> <laughs> yeah it turns out funny, funny color name on discord <laughs> um cool so we'll get into new developments um 
Uh, first one up here is a bit late, but, you know, we thought we were getting this one out earlier, so re-recording, we're going to end up a bit late on this one. Uh, LotusCon. I think Ian has already put out, like, two videos since his LotusCon video, so that's the... I feel like that's the new, like, omni-measure of how late your episode is for, like, any CDH content creators. It's just, like, has <laughs> how, how many tournament uh, reports has Ian put out since the uh, the one that you're doing one for? Yeah, it's uh, it's fine if he's put out one, but when he puts out the second one, that's uh... yeah, you're just like oh, okay, that's, you're gonna get this one out the door. <laughs> um, so yeah, LotusCon was fun. We're gonna I guess talk about it a bit, and like it definitely helps um, contextualize some of the stuff we'll be talking about this archetype or during this episode as well. Sorry, archetype episode. Um, yeah, I mean it was definitely uh it was definitely a fun one. I think uh, largest uh, IRL CDH event of all time by registrants, which is pretty pretty neat. I think pretty awesome. Uh, a lot of fun people, good rounds. Uh, I ended up making top sixteen, which I'm pretty happy about because I think it was my first uh first big CDH tournament in like a year, <laughs> almost like to the day, something like that. Um, last time I entered a big one was like a. I mean, aside from the Bucktown Bully stuff, it was like, yeah, Oak Oktoberfest last year. So, yeah, basically a year. Um, and I'm happy that I managed to top 16 playing a deck that I didn't really want to play in a configuration that I wasn't completely happy with without having really practiced much leading up to it. So, staving off wash allegations for yet another year. <laughs> Yeah, I unfortunately uh, am confirmed washed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, couldn't I, uh, quite get there this time. Had my run ended in a very upsetting way that I don't yeah. want to talk about. But uh, <laughs> yeah, fair. go DM Morgan if you want to hear the story, or like go on to our Discord don't. or something. We're probably not going to put it on. <laughs> we'll put it on the air, but it's. It, I think it's a story worth hearing. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was uh, super fun. Great. To, I. I mean, I. I always. I always have a great time um, going out and, like, going to a big tournament and, like, seeing all the... It's it's nice that there's, like, a consistent group of, like, CDH tournament grinders now. Like, that's just a thing that you can, like, go to an IRL tournament. There are a bunch of, like, faces that I know that, like, have top 16 a bunch and just, like, enter everything. And it's nice to just be able to, like, sort of, like, after, like, a year of not doing so, just, like, come back and just, like, be able to hang out with everybody again and just, like, chill and have, like, a... You know, just, like, a group of people that you can be comfortable hanging out with and talking with at uh like these larger tournaments right yeah it turns out that there are some cool people in this community <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> contrary to popular belief we're not all complete scumbags some of us are you know hearts of gold and all that <laughs> yeah it was it was fun obviously uh the the, <laughs> the tournament itself had uh it's it's fair share of, yeah fair share of, of bumps issues. it was a, a little rocky um there were some issues with their their new software but uh they did get everything sorted out in the end and uh yep largely some uh some pretty great play and great games yeah uh, it's, i mean yeah I, I think the uh sort of the iffiness in the actual tournament um procedure and like how it was run was sort of made up for by like yeah i think that there was a lot of really good play. Uh, I know, like, basically all, like, all of the matches, sorry, not basically all the matches, but, like, all of the matches that I played were um, really fun. Like, all the people that I played with were very, like, just great to play with. Um, pretty on top of it. I noticed that a lot more over time of, like, excuse me, even in early rounds in tournaments now. Um, like, you know, you used to be able to, like, sort of raffle stomp your way over, like, early rounds with people not really knowing what they're doing. But now, like, everybody's just, like, turns out very confident in the format because it's, like, sort of, like, almost a real tournament format now. And turns out the people that enter those things, like, have done preparation and aren't just showing up with casual EDH decks anymore. So, it's pretty neat. Yeah, it's, uh, definitely just really good to, like, see the, the quality of play improving. Also, one thing that was really cool was, like, a lot of the players who, in, at least in my estimation, were, were playing quite well, um, were just, like, local or at least, uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, nearby. Yeah, like, not online at all. Yeah, just, like, sort of showed up. So, so it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, it's just we have this larger, I mean, like, we, there is a, a crew of, of grinders, for lack of a better term, um, but also, there's just now, like, you know, I think we're seeing local communities uh, 
also just getting better. Um, and yeah, you know, we're and not we're now in a place where a random local community might have like some, you know, a decent saturation of uh, of really strong players who can like fill out a local tournament, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, and like definitely like compete for taking top sixteens and top fours and taking the tournament down as well, which is just like really cool. It's cool to see like. Especially, like, I think what would be considered in, like, a 1v1 magic, like, local heroes, but, like, they're actually just sort of on the skill level of some of the best players in the format in a lot of ways and are just, like, actual constant threats. Just awesome. Great to see. Uh, cool. So that was uh, Lotus Con. And then for our next two developments, you want to take this one, Morgan? Uh, sure. Uh, we are going to be at the uh, Buff Town Bullies. Uh, whatever it's called, tournament. Win an so underground sea, something like that. Is it just called Win an Underground Sea? I, th I think they don't have like actual I, names for the tournament. They're I don't know called. if it I has think, it, its own name, but there's uh, like a Win a there's an Underground Sea. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> on uh, November fourth in Buffalo. Um, so if you're, you know, if that's something you can make it out to, then that'd be awesome. Do uh, that. As always, you know, we're uh, we're big fans of the Bufftown Bullies. They put on great events. Uh, they're just, uh, you know fun people to hang around with um and so yeah hopefully uh hopefully you know if you're finding out about this you can you can make it down uh, be that, it's yeah. always a good time and uh they have pizza so that's also good they do dinner included in entrance fee which is uh more local should do that one <laughs> i think personally yeah it's uh it's a an excellent addition to the formula of cdh tournaments yep Absolutely. Oh, and actually, sorry, I'm just looking at the tournament right now. It's actually uh, UC for first, and they're actually giving away Tundras for top four, which is uh, pretty hot. That's a lot of Tundras to give away. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of Tundras to give away. So, yeah, if you want to come down, uh, spots are limited. I think they're capped at 64, and uh, some of those are gone already. So, you know, if you want to make it out to that one, make sure you uh, grab a spot where you can. For sure. Cool beans, cool beans. Um, all right, so that is it for new developments, and now we are going to get into our main topic here, um, which is, again, talking about sort of the current state of the CDH meta. Um, more accurately, the CDH tournament meta, what people are playing, especially in top 16s, top 4s, and what decks are sort of making it up there, and sort of like what, what, are the, what the real containers are, sort of the things that are seeing play across a bunch of different tournaments in a bunch of different places. Um, so just before getting into into any specifics here, um, I have this point because I feel like it's sort of worth talking about, which is that, um, and I 100% am going to be called out for like an incredible amount of bias for this opinion, I feel like, but the current arc, the current, um, current sort of uh, meta feels very natural to me. Um, it's sort of in a place right now where in general mid-range is sort of the default so you want to be playing um like any deck with like a good amount of value in the command zone plus some colors plus good win cons um is sort of where you want to be there's a lot of t and k and tivit and uh you know timda based stuff and i don't know there's even like low color stuff like talion and like that those kinds of decks hanging around um where like yeah you just sort of like draw a good amount of cards, play the grind game a bit, and then uh, go for protected wins and stuff. Um, and I, I feel like there is still space for some faster stuff and maybe some stacks, probably not. Um, I don't know, it just, it feels very natural to me. Uh, I, I guess what sort of, uh, I think, I, I agree to an extent, um, I think what sort of causes that to an extent is uh, just the, like, it intuitively makes sense that um, sort of the, like, generic decks should not be on the extremes, and then there are a bunch of more extreme decks trying to, like, beat the generic decks on right. a specific axis. So, right. like, when, you know, when Turbo is, like, the best thing and, and everyone's just playing Turbo, um, it feels a little weird that you're if you're trying to beat turbo, you're going either slow or really slow compared to sort of the like generic list that you're expecting to face. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's in the middle, it's like, okay, I can try and get under it or I can try and, you know, go over top or around um, feels a little bit more, more natural. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Like, do you have thoughts on, like, what you, like, your personal opinions of the meta right now in terms of, like, uh, maybe not health. I guess we can talk about health at sort of the end of this entire thing. But, um, you know, do you, do you like this style of meta? Do you wish it was different in, like, any meaningful way right now? Um, I, I do think that, um, uh, I think that it's, like, over-centralized around a certain... I mean, certain cards that obviously right. will be classic cards, later, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Dockside, Oracle, both come to mind. But I think um, I I don't know how to like answer or like fix this without because like the obvious fix uh, would be it's incredibly toxic and, and awful. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't love the. Uh, the way creatures play, I think, is, is a little unhealthy mm -hmm. in certain aspects. Um, yep. Some decks that essentially completely rely on on like resolving, you know, one of the creatures that makes it hard for interaction to work on uh, to work on your non-creature right. threats. Uh, I, I'm not Ranger sure. Ranger Captain and Grand Abolisher. Yeah. yeah, Ranger Captain Grand Abolisher, that sort of stuff. I'm not sure it's particularly healthy. Especially, um, like, I think it's fine if we play in a format where creatures are harder to interact with than other types of spells. Like, I don't think that dynamic is inherently unhealthy. Right. But I don't think it's healthy when the consequence of that is not... Um, that to play more creatures. Creature, creature decks have, you know, this like specific advantage that they can try and leverage, but maybe are just sort of a little bit worse. Their combos are more clunky or like it's obviously slower, you know, less sickness, explosive. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but the consequence we're actually seeing is just uh, <laughs> the other decks. Are the non-creature decks yeah. are using the creatures that allow them to beat stuff that interacts with non-creature spells. Uh, to protect their non-creature based combos, right? And I'm not exactly sure that's sort of <laughs> yeah, the healthiest fair. way of addressing that. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, that dynamic. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, cool. So let's yeah, let's uh, I guess let's get in on talking about sort of the meta in general and where we perceive it to be at. Um, I think we're gonna, we were sort of going to break down the, um, the top decks in the meta more by archetypes and then sort of like talking about them by archetype rather than talking about them by specific deck because it's sort of, I, I feel like it sort of gives a better idea of where we're at, um, aside from some specific stuff. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the boogeyman, um, blue, black X, blue, black plus, um, mostly meaning four and five color um some amount of three color in there as well sort of thrown in for a variety but uh this is really like the i think the big boogeyman's of the format would boogie men of the form boogie people of the format um uh are now very obviously and i think as they probably should have been for however many years now four years five years um are four color and five color uh partners and uh some five color checked in for variety um there just turns out Tim does a busted card, and when you play her in four color decks, uh, she does a lot of really good stuff, especially when she has good cards surrounding her. Honestly, I don't really know how anyone could have seen it coming <laughs> that uh, having access to the best card pool and starting with a free extra card in the command zone is is a winning combination. And one of the free extra cards in the command zone being possibly the best commander ever to be printed. <laughs> I mean, sure, maybe that helps. <laughs> maybe, maybe, that, maybe that helps a bit. Um, I can't definitively say it doesn't help. But, <laughs> but you know. Um, but, yeah, I, so I think the way that we're going to talk about this in general is... Um, excuse me. Um, it's really... There's sort of, like, a split here where... Um, so, obviously, blue-black X... Uh, the blue-black card pool is sort of, like, the defining characteristic of these decks in general. It turns out the Oracle Consult is a really good combo. We've known this for a really long time. Nobody has really ever stopped playing it because it's sort of the best standalone thing to be doing in the format to actually win the game. Um, so, very important to have that around. Uh, and blue and black 
together just sort of offer you a very, very clean base to work off of for a CDH deck. Um, blue, I would say, is probably the most, like, if we're not bringing commanders into the uh, into the question, to the discussion immediately, blue is probably the most important color in tournament CDH. Yeah. Um, it turns out Counter's Magic and uh, Thassa's Oracle and um, just some random stuff like, you know, Mr. Kamar and Rustic Study are really good, really important to have in a CD-ish deck. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this is sort of a an interesting... Uh, I don't know. It's not exactly a dilemma, um, but just, like, I do think there's, uh, like, we could get to a point where blue isn't necessarily the most important color for, like, a given person to be right. playing, uh, but currently, as the CDH meta stands, um, it's, it's a little risky, um, trusting other people with, uh, with the interaction and there are lots of combos that can really only consistently be interacted with with blue, blue cards blue. yeah um i think we the way that we talked about this on the previous recording of this episode was that uh um yeah blue like counter magic is just like super important in a way that you can't just like replicate with any other color stuff in uh meaningful quantities where it's like pieces of counter magic are both things that stop your opponents from interacting with your one attempts. So like they can effectively, I mean, depending on the situation, but they effectively do the job of like a silence or a red blast or, you know, just like a veil or a defense grid or whatever. A lot of the time um, when you're trying to win and then when you're not trying to win, there are incredible resources that making you not die and like you get to keep playing the game. Um, and Which there are is important if you yeah, are planning out. on uh, <laughs> eventually winning the game. Yeah. You have um, to not lose first. That is step one. It's just, and they're like one of those things that like, again, you don't, we're not saying blue's required, but it's like the most, it's probably the most important thing. Um, and you're definitely consciously giving something up if you're not playing blue in your deck. And, you know, that can be for good reason. Um, but, uh those pieces of counter magic are also really integral to um sort of oh what it completely slipped my mind um uh which is wild because i use this phrase all the time it's a uh, player agency anyway it's thinking? yeah it's it's sort of but like not generating play anyway it's it's important for the concept of player agency uh for basically leveraging your skill as a player um because it turns out like having these like super versatile options that like interact with stuff on the stack and interact both uh protectively and disruptively are just like they give you so much uh more equity in a lot of these situations or like so much more ability at least to like leverage uh your own skill as a player to be able to like make the game happen how you need it to happen or how you want it to happen um and you just have like so much less of that agency when there's no blue in the deck and there's no ability for you to just generically answer very powerful things yeah it's uh you really have to put in a lot of effort uh to be interactive in other colors and usually that involves being very proactively uh disruptive which uh you know requires you to commit things ahead of time and also yeah. is uh you know can get in the way of of your own plans or people can remove your stuff or plan around it because you have to deploy it ahead of time you just show it to them yeah it's like here here's the thing that you have to deal with it's in play now <laughs> go, go do your thing yeah um, so, yeah, blue, it turns out blue and black, very important. Um, oh, we didn't really talk about black that much. Black is just, obviously, um, there for, I mean, ostensibly the consult and the tainted pack, but also, you know, turns out tutors are really good, uh, be able to consistently access the, the exact thing that you need at any given point in time is a very powerful effect, especially in 100 card singleton, um, and tutors just sort of let you operate 
you know, decks in the... It lets you build decks better. It lets you play the deck better, more consistently, because you just way more consistently have access to, again, the thing that you need. Um, and as well as that, you know, offers some other stuff as well. Rituals are always nice to have, some mana acceleration. Uh, a couple of interesting creatures that are pretty good right now, Opposition Agent and uh, Orcish Bowmasters. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the big stuff right now for playing black is really the tutors and the forbidden tutors. Yeah, the like, obviously CDH staples uh, include a lot of cards that are banned in other formats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, the black staple list in particular is actually just, like, the legacy yeah, ban slash ban vintage legacy restricted cards. list yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of black cards. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a reason those cards are restricted and or yep. banned or whatever they are in whatever format you're, we're discussing. And it's because uh, why they're we really playing? good. Yeah. And then obviously, like, there's Nas on here as well. But even, like, dude, I I feel like Nas is such less of a reason to be playing Black recently. Um, it, don't get me wrong. Card's still busted. has been busted for an eternity of time. And, like, I... Doubt that it will cease seeing play in meaningful numbers into, like, the future, basically, at all, until it ever gets banned or not. Um, but, I like, the the real power behind Black is the, uh, I think, the Thorgal Consult combo plus the Tutors. It's just, like, so powerful. Well, yeah, certainly, like, we've seen, you know, various people float the idea of taking decks that were historically Nas decks, Nas decks and, uh, yeah. and, and just not playing Nas, putting in a couple more like mid-rangey pieces you know people experimenting with stuff like shieldred um and uh you know obviously like we've seen a huge up huge presence of the one ring but uh i i don't think i've heard anyone suggest cutting demonic tutor from yep. many of those decks <laughs> yep. yet not quite <laughs> i think it's gonna take a lot for for me to hear that suggestion <laughs> like yeah it's like some like five color opposition agent in the command zone or something it's just like okay guess we're all just playing card draw now <laughs> Leo will accept five color and for searching libraries yeah <laughs> um so yeah uh so that's current state um for in terms of uh stuff that's like in terms of colors that are more important afterward, um, I'd say it's probably red than white. Um, maybe depending on how the meta keeps evolving, it might end up being white over red. But I, I think, like, red is still pretty solidly ahead of white right now. Um, and that would be because of basically exactly two cards. Uh, Doxan Extortionist and Underworld Breach. Um, turns out, those are really, really good at... Um, completely changing the texture of a deck and sort of how it functions and what its threat windows are. Um, the whole reason why the Grix is a powerful shell right now is because um, blue-black is a very good core for generating uh, cards, generating an advantage. Obviously, like, Grixis commanders, they or, like, the good commanders tend to be Grixis commanders because they give you access to both the Wincon and a bunch of great card engines and happen a lot of the time to be card engines themselves. Um, and red really just, right now, gives the best cards to convert off of massive card advantage um, in the most explosive manner. Uh, without red, you end up having a bit of issue a lot of the time with actually, like, converting, say, like, 15 cards, 20 cards to a win. Um, with red, it becomes trivial. Uh, Underworld Breach is incredibly mana efficient as a win condition. In fact, better than Thassa's Oracle in a lot of situations, like Thassa's Oracle Consult in a lot of situations, considering it can just be a one-card win condition. And also, um, even when it's not a one-card win condition, it's much less color-intensive uh, most of the time. Uh, and then Dockside, additionally, just adds to the explosiveness where, even if you don't have a Breach uh, available to you, um, Dockside, for one and a colored mana, basically unlocks all of those cards that you have in your hand as soon as it resolves. Yeah, they uh, certainly designed some cards. <laughs> yep, definitely definitely release some cards. Those cards are, like, are very valid. designed. <laughs> um, and that's sort of like where we're at right now with... Um, I would say, like, the generic value decks in the meta, for, so, like, four and five color, um, is, especially when you're in four color and three color uh, specifically, 
Um, you really have to have a reason not to be playing red right now where, um, again, it just, it gives you threat windows that you can't get without red, um, where you just like can very, very consistently, uh, end a game off having a lot of cards. And turns out the meta right now, spoiler alert, is really about, uh, drawing cards and getting ahead of the rest of the table in card advantage and to a lesser degree man advantage. Um, it, there's a lot of, uh... A lot of the meta is sort of centralized specifically around uh, Mystic Remora, Rhystic Study, Esper Sentinel, One Ring um, as cards. And then sort of any way that you can replicate that style effect across any other spread of cards. So like Chroms, Timnas, um, some amount of Thrasios, Tibets, Atraxas, just anything to get more cards into your hand for free. Um, some amount of Talion as well right now is sort of picking up steam. Um, and yeah, so to give sort of a base... A baseline for evaluating the meta, that's sort of the thing that you want to be doing as a default, and then everything else is built around that. So you want to build your deck around being able to win in the cases where you have those things. You want to be able to build a deck to compete with opponents trying to do those things, whether that means directly competing with them in cards or trying to get around that somehow. Um, a lot of people playing stuff like Kinden right now, which we'll talk about later, uh, which sort of bypasses that to a degree or sort of plays around it to a degree. Um... And yeah, so that's that's why red's good right now. <laughs> it's also why, Morgan, if you want to pick up why white is good right now, as we've sort of talked about a bit already. Yeah, uh, so it turns out that um, there's a lot of interaction and a lot of card draw, as uh, as mentioned. You know, these uh, everyone's playing their Rhystic Studies and their Mystic Remoras, and that makes it really hard to win with uh, anything that wants to cast a lot of spells, which is a lot of... A pretty integral part of a lot of decks, <laughs> like most decks right now, method yeah. of winning the game. Um, so uh, you know that's a that's a little bit awkward. But uh, Wizards has helpfully printed some cards in uh, in white that kind of just let you ignore that, um, which is uh, pretty neat if you're in those if you're in those colors and could take advantage of them. Uh, obviously, we're talking about. Uh, the Grand Abolishers and Ranger Captains of the World, uh, which are uh, difficult to interact with uh, <laughs> at the best of times. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they uh, they can be uh, resolved, and then you don't have to worry about your opponent just drawing into a million counter spells as you storm off or do your breach turn or resolve your gnaws or whatever, whatever nonsense it is you're wrong, doing. Wrong, yeah. uh, so... A lot of the meta has sort of devolved from turning the the X card combos that used to be dominant into uh like X plus one ranger card combos yeah. with either a ranger captain or a grand abolisher. <laughs> yeah. Um because uh yeah, there's just a lot of interaction for a lot of other things people might be trying to do. Um and that's uh pretty pretty comfortably the best way we actually have of of getting around that problem uh, and so people yeah. will people do try that. and take advantage of it yeah um i think we're i'm not sure how many blue farm pods are still on cavern of souls tech but that's sort of like the next direction there once people start being like oh i need to like play things that counter creatures it's just like okay let's just like play things that make you not counter creatures even harder and then we'll just play like four card combos instead <laughs> yeah like um, i mean I think the fact that it was ever, I mean, like, I think some people are still playing it, but also just, yeah. like, the fact that it was ever even ever a consideration yeah. is, like, a little bit unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, because I, like, I remember, I remember a very toxic time a few years ago, and I, this is, I'll get my, like, flash mention in for this episode, my, like, mandatory flash mention of, like, there, there was a time when, like, the flash meta was like, oh yeah, we'll play, like, Besejus and like, OG Besages and Cavern of Souls to try to, like, sneak through uh, uncatterable wins because, like, otherwise you just, like, get flashed on top of. Um, and the fact that we're getting to that point now without instant speed wins is sort of telling. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it turns out everybody always has interaction for everything, so you just have to be doing the least interactable thing or substituting um, your interactable thing with a very uninteractable prelude to it. Do you think we're ever sort of side 
sidecar to this, I guess. Do you think we're ever going to get to the point where people in, like, the four color decks are going to start cutting silences? Sorry, cutting silences? Yeah. Like, not, not like, not like Ranger Captain and Granite Vulture, but, like, cutting, like, silence. <laughs> no? No. I feel like... Wait, why? I, I don't understand why... Because I think there are a lot of people who... Silence is a much more interactable version of Ranger Captain and, excuse me, and Grand Abolisher. And to a certain extent, I feel like people hate using it as an interactive spell um, or like a disruptive spell and would like just rather have a counter spell in that slot. And I feel, I feel like I can feel a world coming, depending on how the meta develops, of course, where people are just like, I would rather just have the next best single blue counter spell than this silence a large percentage of the time. So I can actually, like, deal with people trying to win, and then I'll just, like, my silence will just be going for a ranger captain or a grand abolisher. Or, like, a Teferi. Well, so here's the thing about that, though. Like... Silence actually does line up extremely like it, it's a it's a quote unquote counter spell that actually does work. It doesn't work against Grand Abolisher, but it does kind of work against Ranger Captain. Against Ranger Captain, yeah. So I like I think it's gonna be one of the last cards to go. I think That's we'd fair. see uh we'd see, you know, people trimming down on cards like, I don't know, dispel or like mm. offer or whatever. Oh sure. I, I mean I think yeah. I mean I think like Flusterstorm stays forever, forever. Swan Song probably stays forever. Like yeah. whatever the next piece of interaction is after that. You just start cutting I think we definitely see those going, potentially even people trimming things like force of negation uh before we see people cutting sides. That's that sounds wild to me for the record. Um I would encourage anybody that's playing like anything close to a mid range deck to just get like on all the free stuff because it just matters so much. But yeah, <laughs> to be clear, I, this is like yeah, yeah in yeah, a yeah. hypothetical I, like, world yeah. where we get like three more ranger captains. <laughs> ranger effects. captains, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, even then, like you just like want the force of negation for turn one rustic studies and one rings and stuff, right? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it's just too important to be able to stop people from winning. Or maybe at that point you just like. It just ceases to be a mid-range meta, and you just play Turbo all the time, because nobody can ever interact with each other efficiently. Right, I'm proud there. <laughs> the, the year is 20xx. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, Yeah, so let's like sort of talk about some of the decks here, and then we'll talk about the last color afterward, because I think there's more discussion to be had there, and we're both sims for it, so <laughs> it's going to be tainted a bit, but let's talk about the colors sort of in these categories first, because... There are definitely two categories, and it's split on on if you're on red or not in here, like in the in these subcategories where blue black red decks are very different. We talked about this earlier, very different texturally texturally to uh, blue black X decks without red. Um, blue black X decks with red, obviously five color. Um, Tim the Crom. There's a bit of a what's it called a Rayhan Crom and Ikra Crom running around right now. I I Rayhan Crom is really cool. I, I sort of love that deck, I'm not gonna lie. Um bit of like not so much thrash pile, I don't think. Um and then what, like Blues Clues and the uh I guess the other one doesn't really count, whatever the time sieve uh what's her name? It's like the two uh the Boros and the Oh, uh yeah. I What is that one? Because Blues Clues is the small dudes, right? Yeah, Lucas and I, I, I don't remember the universes within names for any right. of these cards. I learned them as, uh, as strange. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think anybody and... does, honestly. <laughs> What's the... Yeah, anyway. Oh, Sicily and... No, isn't Cecily... Cecily's I thought the Cecily's the Grixis one. Yeah, it is. But they don't they play Grixis plus... Or am I getting that wrong? Oh, isn't maybe it Grixis plus the Grixis Boros plus one? Boros? Yeah, I guess it yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... I forget what the Boris one's called. Anyway, that one. <laughs> I'm not sure that even fits in this category. I guess it does. They're mid-range. Um, but yeah, like those style of decks. Um, oh, I guess uh, people are going to say Thras Rock here. I wouldn't post Thras Rock here. You don't really have like anything in the command zone that does anything for your mid-range game. Um, I guess like... Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I'd put any of the like really played Grixis ones. Oh, I guess like Armix Krom, Tevesh Krom. <clears throat> sort of seeing less Tevesh Krom right now, which is sort of interesting, but I think Armix Krom is like reasonable. There's an Armix Krom in the top four. Lost to that one twice <laughs> at uh 
I don't know what's going on at Lotus Con. Uh, great to you, by the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it is kind of funny, like, <laughs> the sort of, like, we're seeing an uptick in decks that can, you know, deal with creatures, but still <laughs> yeah. kind of a steadfast refusal to, like, just put some... <laughs> to play more creature removal and creature counter spells. <laughs> yeah, no, why would you ever do that? Just play commanders that deal with them instead so I don't have to commit deck slots to playing eerie, like, <laughs> bad removal cards. Please, please, for the love of God, play more removal. Anybody who's listening to this, play more removal in your decks. You just, you don't, you don't play enough. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. You do not play enough removal. <laughs> um... But yeah, so like blue red deck, blue black red decks, Grixis plus decks, um, pretty tend to be especially the mid range stuff tends to be pretty samey in terms of actual deck composition. Like basically a few slots of spice and a bit of space to work around with for your like mid range game and like some of those pieces. But a lot of it is sort of like predetermined just because you need to be playing all the best value engines, a bunch of the best counter magics, and the good removal, um, the good combos, etc. All the fixing, um. And then, yeah, uh, aside from that one, we have just the other blue-black decks, um, which, I mean, what, the best ones right now are the ones that are, I think you wrote this down, right? The ones that are, like, still trying to be explosive, just without Dockside? Yeah, so, like, obviously Dockside is, you know, far and away the most efficient way of uh, translating a lot of cards, or, like, getting a lot of mana so you can translate a lot of cards into a win. Um, and I think the shift we've seen in the blue-black decks that aren't red is towards trying to replicate that, um, by just doing something, uh, you know, broken, uh, in terms of mana, and I think the, the best ways people have come up with, uh, to do that is, uh, leverage Jeweled Lotus and play, uh, you know, some commander that's absolutely disgusting, uh, and then uh, cheat that mana cost pretty easily, and then try and you know chain something from there. So obviously uh, Tivit and Atraxa, which uh, man, a few years ago, I mean I guess before the printing of Jeweled Lotus, if you were like, yeah. hey, one day the best uh, <laughs> some, some of the, of the best, best commanders are going to cost yeah. six and six seven and mana seven, respectively, yeah. and they're not going to be I... used as at last they're going to be used as just like things that you hard cast to do a thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would not have believed you. Um, and, and then that's, they printed uh... actual literal black lotus for commanders, and then it's just like, oh, <laughs> yeah, well, that makes more sense. <laughs> Once upon a time, Wizards of the Coast understood that. Uh, Black Lotus was a really good card and I think they momentarily forgot that fact <laughs> and we all have to live with the consequences yeah. that's actually that's actually the hidden third red card it's not actually a red card but it sort of fits in the style of why the red cards are good is like actually Jewel Lotus is like the secret other player in like the current meta of just like yeah it turns out when you can just like consistently well especially in black decks you can consistently tutor for Black Lotus for a particular usage um, yeah, those decks tend to be a lot better, and it tends to change how those decks play a lot. Yes, come to Into the North for your hot takes, like, Black Lotus is a good <laughs> yeah, card, I, actually. I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel like we've had <laughs> very few actual hot takes up to this point. Uh, I think we're about to get into a couple, though. Um, that being said, so, yeah, so I th the big ones right now are, like, yeah, Tivin and Attracts are the big, like, non, non-red, um, like, uh, soup decks. Um, Thrasios Timna, unfortunately, a bit dead. <laughs> I don't think it's like actually that dead. I just think that the... Uh, I think there is some tension in sort of... Especially the mid-range styles of Thras Timna right now. Um, where it just doesn't... Like, you, you're you sort of pulled in a bit too many directions. And you're a bit too weak to some of the just incidental things that people are playing in their decks right now. Um, to where it's just... It's just not quite enough. Um, you sort of got to have a bit better, a bit more explosiveness. Yeah, At it's, uh, I think it's sort of the, the issue is, is like, even if you are sort of a little bit better in like the mid range game or particularly, you know, against stacks than something like a, a Timna Krom deck, like they can still handle that, you know, decently well. 
but on the flip side, uh, if you don't have, uh, or like, ba basically, the things that Theresia's Timna does better than Timna Krom, it does a little bit better, and the things that Timna Krom does better than Theresia's Timna, it does a lot better. Yeah. Um, and so, when you find yourself in the scenario of like, oh, I've drawn a bunch of cards, and I think there's a good window to go for a win, uh, you can definitely be handicapped by your lack of fast mana, um, you generally, like, don't build the deck to have as explosive starts, though certainly, like, some I, effort could be like, they could yeah, be built I, I, in that I think way. There's, again, like, I, I think, I think, sorry, my, I think my statement was, like, really just that Thrasius Timna is, like, dead in its current iterations of just, like, playing the absolute mid-range grind fest. I think there's definitely space to explore with, like, making it potentially more explosive and, like, building it in certain ways that are, like, less reliant on the things that get hated out by, like, Orcish Bowmasters, for instance, or, like, you know, maybe going even slower um, and playing a d completely different resilient game altogether. But, yeah, there's a... I think you gotta, you gotta build toward those a bit. You can't just, like, sit in the middle anymore. Yeah, I, I think, uh, sort of, I guess we just reached a point where, like, trying to play, or, like, trying to play the, the hate that you can leverage, um, just gets in, in your way more than it gets in your opponent's way, or maybe not more, but just, like, not enough to make up for the lack yeah. of streamlining. Yeah, yeah, Um, like, you know, the flexibility of playing Collector Roof was always, like, one of the big upsides there, yeah. but now it's like, okay, is it just actually too slow or yeah. not good would enough? I, would I rather just be playing the One Ring? And a lot of the time the answer is just yes. Like, it's just yeah, like, like, oh, the One like Ring I, and Soul yeah. Cauldron. They sort of just, like, yeah, they sort of, like, killed Oof just because... <laughs> just, just because there are cards that you actually want to be playing in those decks now, and it's just like, wow, this is this is making Oof even harder to justify in these decks. Where like before, you know, you can justify it. I'm only playing like some mana rocks, none of the rest of the stuff is super required. Um, and you can definitely afford to play without it, and Oof is a powerful enough effect. Now it's just like, well, I just want like want to be playing these cards. <laughs> um so that's a that's a pretty good I I'd say that's a pretty good segue into talking about green here, sort of our last piece of talking about the colors and the uh specifically like the big boogeyman um mid-range decks sort of just like the generically powerful stuff um green's sort of interesting because it's uh it's definitely i would say it definitely offers the least um sort of upfront for the mid-range games at this point um you don't really get like you know on its own it doesn't give you a huge amount of like uh, explosive mana acceleration to convert off of cards. It doesn't give you cards on its own, really. It doesn't give you protection on its own, um, aside from, like, if you want to play Dosan, which please don't be play Dosan. I mean, maybe play Dosan if you're playing, like, Simic or something. Don't play Dosan in 4-color. Um, yeah, and it's just, like, it, it's just sitting in a weird spot where it doesn't, it doesn't give you any of that stuff that matters <laughs> up front. Um, what it does do is uh, sort of, like, less tangible stuff. Um, so green gives you a lot of um, consistency. So dorks specifically offer you a ton of consistency in mulligans. Uh, it makes your deck less consistent. Or, sorry, not less It makes your deck more consistent. Less explosive to be playing a huge bunch of mana dorks in a deck. Um, even then, you can just, like, cut down to just, like, the the multicolor dorks. Um right. And then, like, still have a fair amount of smoothing. Um, they're just really nice for, like, you know, if you're playing a deck that's looking a lot of the time for, like, fast mana plus uh, powerful start on turn one or turn two, uh, Doors can get you to the powerful start on turn two very consistently. Obviously, you're going to miss out on the turn one stuff a bit, but um, just, like, having one drop accelerants that get, that get you up to three mana on turn two can be very powerful if you're just, like, planning on sticking a Rhystic Study ASAP every game. Um, and it means that you don't have to mulligan down to, like, four to find those hands sometimes. Um, and then I would also say the other power of green right now, I mean, obviously like collector roof and like some of the, um, stuff there, but I would say the big one, honestly, um, and this is the other part of why I think, um, green is, I, I feel like undervaluated in some ways, um, where it probably shouldn't be. I think it's correctly undervaluated in some ways, but in some other ways, like, I think it's just people haven't experienced playing with it enough or like sort of playing it with it with this mindset enough, which is that the 
to board creature tutors like Green Eyes and SX2, so Neo Forum, Eldritch Evolution, Finale, Green Sun, Zenith, Invasion, all that kind of stuff, Cord. Um, they're really powerful effects. And I would say they're really powerful effects, probably not for the reasons that you're thinking of. Um, they are very powerful effects, especially in a mid-range meta where there's a lot of blues uh, floating around. Because they're sort of... They're variable threat... Um, on the stack and the decisions for how good they are aren't locked in until they're resolving um which means and it sounds that sounds really weird and that sounds like a really like not a case to be made for why they're good but i'll tell you why and the reason is because uh if you put an ad nauseum on the stack uh and somebody has counter magic in their hand um they can just be like, I'm going to counter that because you're just going to nause and kill us. And there's not a whole lot you can do about that besides saying, like, I guess I'll only take, like, five cards off of this nause if you don't counter it. Which, I, like, nobody's ever going to do, right? They're just going to, like, you know, like, people are... It's it's really hard to make that uh, debate. And it's even harder when there's something like a breach on the stack or something like that. Where it's just like, yeah, I'm not letting you have a breach. I'm not letting you, like, try to work your way th around this or anything like that. Because things sort of spiral out of control. Same thing with, like, if you put a tutor on the stack. If you put a demonic tutor on the stack, um, it's, first of all, hard to convince people to counter it. Um, second of all, if they do decide to counter it, it's because of the hidden information. And it's really hard to convince people not to do so unless you're like, I'm going to tutor this and show what I'm tutoring to the table. Um, the Tabor tutors are a lot weirder and a lot more nuanced where if you have like a finale for x equals three on the stack and the table's like that's getting a ranger captain we need to counter that before they do that you can just be like okay let's let's talk me the person with the tutor on the stack and you the person with interaction in your hand that you're about to put on the stack targeting it let's let's negotiate for what like the maximum willingness for like you to allow me to have is here like okay Ranger Captain, fine, that's off the table. Can we go down to, like, an opposition agent? Can we go down to, like, a Dranith Magistrate? Like, what what can we do here where you don't have to burn your act, your interaction, and then I also get something out of this, but you don't also, like, just die or, like, have this really bad thing happen immediately? And I think that's, like, a very underutilized part of those cards. Sorry, I dominated airtime for a lot of let Morgan and Hoffman here. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I definitely think you're right, um in in that like they can be leveraged politically um mm. and that is like a lot of the strength of of these cards um and i think also like why maybe they're not seeing as much success because um i mean first of all like leveraging politics is often difficult <laughs> underutilized uh, difficult, like even yeah. like for a player to like engage in good politics is difficult also some players just like won't engage effectively yeah. yep um like you there's there are people where like effectively there's just kind of nothing you can say to like convince them even of things that are mm -hmm. like pretty objectively in their own best yeah. interest yep um and so when you come up against that, uh, there's just, like, sort of a, I don't know, like, you, you can just sort of get punished for, like, trying to play that way, um, uh, because just some other person decided that they're not gonna engage, mm -hmm. um, and that, like, all of that is, uh, is, like, one of the reasons why I think... Uh, it's just a little easier to play, like, very proactive stuff in tournament, broadly. Yep. yep. Uh, it, because, uh, like, you just don't <laughs> you have that inconsistency. Of randomness of the rest of the table, yeah. Of, like, I need to leverage some, like, aspect of this game or my play to... You know, <laughs> you're sort of, do you're sort of... You just sort of go, like, cool, uh, I have this good position and I'm going to leverage it by killing you all and then then it'll be great and we'll move on <laughs> you're just you're just sort of sponging up all the variants from the rest of the table when playing fast proactive stuff in tournament it's just like okay i just i don't care about like the variants of the rest of the table now i just care about the variants on like what i'm bringing in terms of a deck and what my mulligans are going to look like and then like sort of minorly what you guys end up playing slash having in hands at the start of the game yeah 
Uh, yeah, so that's that's our green do. Also, the Sylvan Library is still good, and Carpet of Flowers is still nuts, but people don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want to hear it. There you go. <laughs> hey, man, I, uh, pe- I don't know. People, people, I feel like people did appreciate Carpet, but definitely in the, se- <laughs> in the semis or in the, rather in the quarters of the, oh, no, semis, uh, top 16 of uh, Lotus Con, at least, very recent memory. Um, it's definitely a couple of times there where uh, Carpet helped a lot because I got board wiped like twice, uh, except both times, like the first time it was a toxic deluge, so it did not clear, and then the second time it was a psych crypt, and I got turns out getting a omni color dark ritual that first of all sits in place, second of all can just like come down and help you redeploy is like really good. Anyway, yeah, I uh, c- can think of very few games where I've been really unhappy with uh, <laughs> yeah. with carpet, like certainly. Yeah. I can think of a lot more games where I've been unhappy with Artifact Fast Mana than I have with, uh, with Carpet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, like, really even, cool. obviously, you know, like, the upside of, like, Mana Crypt and Soaring is, is like, so much higher than, than like, sort of the base case of, of Carpet, of it just yeah, sort of yeah, making yeah. one mana. But, like, I can think of a lot of games where I've had very few cards in hand and no lands that have drawn Mox Diamond and just been, like, <laughs> yeah, god sucks. damn it <laughs> and the number of games where there hasn't been at least one island is uh is pretty small pretty low yeah uh cool so that was mostly our uh pretty much the discussion on blue black x for right now we might uh reference it a bit later but that's sort of a the lowdown on what that what the sort of the archetype to beat right now is and there's like again a lot of space under that archetype there's a lot of work to be done there's a lot of like probably undiscovered tech and decks to play under there but that's sort of like i would say by default where you want to be right now um after that uh I would say probably the second most prominent uh, thing to be doing is some form of low color mid range. Um, so these are mostly decks that are uh, have gone down in colors to access a commander specifically uh, that makes up in a lot of ways or in ways that are pretty specific um, to counter the meta. Uh, to make up for that sort of like lack of um, good card quality in. Uh, and higher colors or sort of just like you know card quality that doesn't care about commanders um and then so low color mid-range is sort of more commander centric but a lot of the time trying to play similar games or trying to play the mid-range game but in different ways um so this is just for examples a lot of stuff like uh so kinnon would be sort of the primary one right now um especially since ian one low's gone on it and uh, i think there's a fair amount of like people doing pretty well with Kinnon in general, I think. Oh um, yeah, there, there's. And for, I mean, like, there's all, just been lots of people and for, for a, a long while, time who... in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, stuff like uh, Tyam. Tyam's a huge one that's seen a decent amount of play. Mo- more online, I'd say, but like a, a smallish amount. Um, I roll. I although I can see that sort of exploding with Soul Cauldron being printed. Although it's not like a key piece for the deck. It's definitely sort of like a nice very nice energy piece um also uh magda somehow still i don't know why people are still playing magda but they are and apparently they're putting up results so all the power to you magda players i I have to admit i kind of respect it (laughs) yeah seriously just i i i do super respect the idea of like yeah so this like won a tournament and like drew a bunch of aggro and like people like super know what this deck does but i just think it's good enough anyway and then i think i just like still just pants tables with this monocolor deck so i'm just gonna keep playing it um I don't know, are there like other there are probably other things that i'm thinking of but a, a lot of this is also like pretty rogue or like personal decks a lot of the time or like just like new brews all the time because this is sort of this is where the metagame evolution is um for the most part in terms of like the sort of like rapidly evolving metagame where people are just like constantly showing up with new decks like this with like commanders that you've never seen before trying to do interesting things i'm um, trying to subvert the meta um yeah so sort of to talk about these decks a bit more um they all mostly exist uh on sort of just spending the entire game like just just a hair's width below the threat assessment level that would actually get them interacted with and that's sort of like the entire point of playing a lot of these decks is that the entire time that you're playing the game you're trying to 
like you try to be a problem, but not quite enough of a problem to where the table is going to be like, oh, God damn, we have to like spend removal on them or spend counter magic or spend in like just resources in general dealing with this person. They're just like, OK, you're annoying and you're probably going to be a problem, but I have bigger things to worry about right now, like this ad nauseum on the stack or like somebody having a risk study out or like something like that. So like I'll deal with you later. Just like hold on for a second. And then by the time they get back to you, you're just like, whoops, I set up a entirely like impossible to interact with engine and you're just gonna lose now or just like i'm winning in some uninteractable manner that you just like weren't prepared for yeah it's definitely uh it's the the cdh equivalent of like just sort of hovering your hand right in someone's face <laughs> like you're not touching them you're not like a problem you don't want to provoke them to actually do something about it you just want to just be right there and just be ready at a moment's notice but yep. uh but have not that, touching have you, that not deniability. Touching you, not touching you, not touching you. And then as soon as they turn away and look out the window, you slap them in the back of the head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's there, yeah. This is this is definitely where. Uh, I, and I think I this is probably a quote from the previous time we um, uh, had this episode, which is where um, I this is I think this is a, probably a lot of again as I said earlier. Um, where you want to be looking as well for, like, potential meta breakers. I think low-color mid-range, like, sort of low-color commander-centric mid-range with, um, like, sort of, especially, like, weird cards. And, oh, sorry, hard to interact uh, with combos as well um, is a big one in this section. Um, is just, like, a really, I think it's a really wide and relatively unexplored pay, uh, space uh, for decks in general. But, yeah, again, sorry huge part of these decks uh they basically all have really difficult to interact with combos um or things that are difficult to interact with with the typical uh interaction suite that the four color and like five color and uh like mid-range three color decks are playing um so a lot of stuff is like oh if my commander resolves i can just like put in a win con at some point without casting additional spells later in the game or oh my win con is like i have a decently value generating commander um and then there's like a creature like a singleton creature that combos with my commander and that gets really hard to interact with because people are playing again just spells and offers and swan songs and stuff yeah um and i think that's like i mean i don't know it feels like a strategy that or, or it's a i think there's two strategies that often get confused for each other hmm um particularly i think the the one that that this often gets mislabeled as is sort of um like actually having people not know what you're doing mm, yeah um which which is a virtue in its own right but isn't like which really is a virtue but here. yeah i definitely don't think it's uh like it it just can't really be a long-term strategy yeah um, the more success you have. Great, great for spiking tournaments um, with a relatively powerful deck. Otherwise, not great for long-term success. Um, and I think, yeah, that that's often, like... Or people will label that, um, like... Or, or confuse that with just having something that genuinely... It's not that you are really close to winning um, and just your opponents don't realize it and so they don't interact with you. It's that you're actually, at least ambiguously, not that close to winning. Obviously, like, maybe you can with, like, cards in hand or whatever. But you actually have to be able to at least plausibly say, with the cards your opponents know about, that you're not close yeah. to winning. Yeah. Um, in order for the strategy to sort of, like, be effective. Because, or, yeah. like... You can trick people for a bit, but eventually you'll run up against someone who understands how your deck works. Uh, and then when you just like fra flagrantly lie about like your game winning cards on board, uh, they're going to call it out to the table and. Uh, <laughs> and then you're they, not going to win the game. <laughs> and then you're not going to win the game, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, definitely uh, the. the like. The, the sweet spot is to be in a deck that actually isn't about to win the game until it's yeah, winning until it's the like game. Right there, yeah. 
Um, or has already won. Yeah. And definitely, like, a lot of this as well is... Um... Oh, sorry. A, a, a big part as well about these uh, low quality mid range decks, too, is that it turns out um, a decent number of them are uh, pretty low mana cost as well, which helps a lot. Not just because you can get them down early, um, but because they're really easy to cast once the table inevitably kills them because you're playing a low color mid range commander that is presumably very threatening. Um, when it gets to stick around for a bit. So having a low CMC commander is very valuable here for when people are like, oh, I need to, like, kill that Kinnon or kill that Magda. And obviously Kinnon and Magda produce mana on their own, or, like, the decks are built in such a way where, like, they just ha happen to make a lot of mana. Um, but, again, being 2 CMC, 3 CMC is a virtue, because um, when they, like, you know, when you have something that needs to stick for a couple of turns and people remove it, it's just a lot easier to actually play the game when your commander now costs 4 mana and you can just, like, recast it, or even 6 mana and still pretty reasonably recast it in longer games. Versus, you know, if you're starting at six with your play around commander, it gets a lot harder to play the game when the table's like, uh, removal spell. No thanks. Well, and, and also, like, not only is it easy to replay them when they get killed, that also means they get killed less. Yes, because, because people evaluate that as such. <laughs> yeah, because people, I mean, somewhat justifiably look at it and go like, okay, sure, I could kill this Kinnon... Um, and it'll cost, you know, four of their nine mana to recast it. Like, why would I even bother? Um, whereas, you know, with with other cards that maybe are... Uh, or, like, commanders that are a little bit more expensive, it's, like, a pretty easy case to make of, like, okay, sure, if I kill, I don't know... I mean, Tivit's a bad example because of Ward, but, like, picture a different six mana commander... Like, cool, that's going to cost them 8 to recast, which is, like, almost Just certainly going to be more or less their yeah. entire turn. Um, it's, like, a much easier sort of case to make uh, than uh, than killing a super cheap commander. Yep. Absolutely. Um, cool. Yeah, so low color mid-range like that. Oh, also, yeah, sorry, the, the other... The other part of low color mid range that's really important. I I keep remembering things that <laughs> I sort of wanted to talk about, but don't have down on show notes. Um, the other the other thing is, um, it's so, so it's sort of along the lines of um, sort of along the lines of uh not of like sort of being the unknown quantity and being like people not really knowing what's going on, but sort of in a wider and more long-term case. Um, and it's not necessarily about winning the game, but one of the really powerful parts of these decks, um, a lot of the time, and something that you should be looking to leverage if you're looking to brew one of these decks or um, like bring one of them to a tournament and you're looking at altering builds a bit, is a um, really big part is that they get to play um, value engines that are like commander based value engines or their value engines because of the commander ability um, or they're like interlock with other pieces in the deck in really specific ways um, and the powerful part about those cards is that they are so much more difficult to evaluate um, and again this is even outside of a winning context even outside of like a combo context where like oh your like combo is really hard to evaluate like how close are you are to winning even just like playing value engines and synergy pieces that are not seen play in a lot of other decks or like require you know a certain number of things to come together for you but you're playing a lot of those already and maybe your commander does some of that stuff um, it's really really valuable to have those things in your deck because it's really easy for a table to evaluate how good a Rhystic Study is. Everybody's evaluated a Rhystic Study. You evaluate a Rhystic Study every other game. You know what it's capable of. You know how to evaluate it. It's a lot harder to evaluate uh, maybe a value piece that draws two cards a turn cycle, but that's because the commander does X and, like, if it has one of the other pieces here. And, like, maybe it's part of an interlocking win condition, but that happens with, like, two other cards in the deck and one of them, and, like, neither of them are in play right now. Like, how do I, how am I supposed to evaluate that? And that's a really big upside to, like, yeah, you're still getting the two cards a turn. You're still doing, like, some amount of the work of a realistic study, and presumably this is going to be for, like, a 2CMC card or maybe, like, a 4CMC card if it's part of a win condition. Um, but it it just makes it harder for the table to both evaluate and then figure out if it's worth interacting with. Um, so it le just lets you sit, like, even further below that 
that line of being interacted with while still being a threat. Yeah, you're really just looking as much as possible to, uh, to like, base to keep your threat uh, potential until it's sort of too late or somehow difficult to to dislodge. Yeah, um, and yeah, that obviously uh, the ambiguity of a card that you know obviously will will synergize with a bunch of other stuff that maybe hasn't been played yet or. Um, there's a few different ways of sort of going about accomplishing that goal. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's all, <laughs> it's all uh, generally quite strong um, yeah. because you can just leverage, uh, you know, the fact that there are, you know, for any given opponent, there are two other people who, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to not look scary. You just have to look less scary than they yeah, do. less scary than them. And and for context, some of the stuff that I'm talking about here um, could be something like a smuggler's copter and like a magnet deck, or like an Acathian money changer. Maybe that's a bit too high for Tyam, but like just like stuff that randomly produces counters in Tyam, where it's like, okay, I know this is producing advantage for them. I it's really hard to evaluate how much, and I'm not sure if I can interact or, or not here. I'm not sure if I can justify using my one like removal spell for this. So, yeah. Cool. Um, unless you have any other thoughts about Lakarla Midrange, I feel like we covered it pretty well here. Um, cool. Uh, the sort of last big, big uh, thing right here um, is uh, Turbo. Turbo tunes out. Still around. Still pretty good. Still some decent Turbo decks. Um, that being said, not in a great position right now. <laughs> I think I think there are a lot of like pretty objectively powerful turbo decks. Um, I don't think there it's the play to be playing one right now without like a really heavy meta read. Um, the issue that is sort of coming up is that um, typically turbo decks <clears throat> turbo decks are sort of the breaker for um, really inbred mid range metas, and that happens because. In mid-range metas, what ends up happening is you'll gradually and gradually um, make more and more assumptions uh, during deck building and during mulligans and tournament about how long a game is going to go. So you start off by maybe it's a turbo meta and you're playing a mid-range deck and it's just like, okay, I'm always keeping interaction here. And you get into less of a turbo meta and it's more mid-range decks in a pod and games tend to go longer on average. You're like, okay, maybe I don't need to have an interactive piece in hand every time when I have opening hands. Maybe I can just like look for a powerful value engine early and then we can just like play the longer game. And then once you get even further into a mid-range meta, it's just like, okay, I'm keeping a hand with like the maximum amount of long-term value and the long-term play against like, you know, people trying to resolve multiple draw engines at once and like really stacking a hand before going for a win and the like early interaction isn't even really that valuable i just need to like get my own stuff down and just have like key interaction point points and i need to have like this notion thief in my opening hand so that i can like get the rest of the table down under i need to have like this orchestra bow masters whatever that's when turbo gets really good um right now we're at a point where the mid-range decks are just like still pretty packed with early interaction not because of the turbo decks on the table but because we're sort of in a mid-range meta right now where you just need to be interacting with the other engines as they come online on, like, turn one and turn two to have a chance in the long game. Um, like, Force of Will on Rhystic Study on turn one is, like, a very common play at this point. Or, you know, trying to, like, mind break trap somebody's turn one Esper Sentinel or, like, Fish or Rhystic Study or whatever is, like, a pretty decent play and, like, pretty important to have access to. Um, and that sort of just means that <laughs> the turret decks are just having a tough time getting through that same interaction. Yeah, I think, like, <laughs> we, we're definitely straining the some of the old, like, theories of how, uh, you metas know, various different uh, archetypes yeah. interact and how metas evolve, um, where, yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, we, when, when the meta has gone, like, peak mid-range in the past, people got into, like, really greedy play patterns. Um, but I think we, like, haven't seen that. So I think this is uh, definitely a much... Uh, the the mid-range swing we're seeing is one that's much more hostile than, than 
towards turbo than past mid-range swings mm-hmm. have been. Yeah, especially like spell-based turbo. Um, in terms of like just trying to put Nas or Breaches or whatever on the stack. Yeah. And like, yeah, the the <laughs> the issue is like also, I know the argument in the past has been like, well, Rock Side can be a mid-range deck because you just like mulligan for turn one Rusty Study. It's like, yeah, well, that's what like all the like mid-range decks are also doing, except they just have like way better plans for when their turn one Rusty Study gets countered. <laughs> like they're just like, oh, okay, I guess I'll wait a turn and then cast Timna and then like still sort of like be in the game and still sort of compete rather than just like, oh. Well, that was, like, the one thing I had going on, so I'm just, like, hoping to rip out of it off the top decks now. It definitely is. I am very happy to see that people are, like... I think there was a period where at least I was getting frustrated, maybe other people were as well, with um, sort of a... (laughs) what felt like a refusal by a lot of people uh, to, like, acknowledge that Cards like Rhystic Study are absolutely game-ending threats. <laughs> Worth countering, yeah. <laughs> um, or removing. And I think, I mean, I think it is also in part because the mid-range, or the, the meta is sort of more hostile to mid-range, uh, people feel like they have a little bit more space. Or hostile to, to turbo, you mean? Sorry, yeah, hostile to yeah. turbo. Uh, people feel like they actually do have a little bit more space to... Uh, like spend their interaction on something like an early Rhystic study yeah. where like in the past when you were facing off just against like all turbo all the time uh there was always that like thought at the back of your head of like okay i can counter this Rhystic study uh, but also like i might just die before i untap to like rog sai or some mardu nonsense or, or whatever um so there is like there's an element of play patterns changing but there's also an element of the the context that created those play patterns is is changing so i think some yeah. it is in part people learning but it's also uh in part the the actual meta uh changing and and having yeah. sort of further cascading impacts on the meta and how people play yeah definitely and this is, again, so Trevor decks that we're talking about here, um, Brock's Eye is sort of the poster child, but there's also, like, a bunch of red-black stuff, even, like, Crick. Um, I would also include Winota in the Turbo category. Winota's not a stack stack as much as people want it to be. Um, if you're still playing, like, Ancient Tombs and, like, a whole bunch of fast mana, maybe not Ancient Tombs, but, you know, like, City of Traders and, like, that kind of stuff, like Simeon Spirit Guides and stuff in that deck to try to get Winota out faster. Um, I don't think you're playing a stack stack. You're just playing a turbo deck that sort of wins in a different way and sort of has a, a different interaction axis. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's the fast mana that makes it not a stack stack. It's the fact that the fast mana is to get Winota out that sure, makes and it then, not a yeah, stack. And then you're, you're playing like Ornithopters and like Memnites and stuff to get her online Shield Spheres. Um, yeah, there's, there's just that... It's a very inconsistent deck where yeah. there are many games where it'll be like turn four and there'll be no stacks in play and yep. uh maybe this is uh maybe this is a hot take but i think if there's a decent portion of games where your stacks deck doesn't put any stacks into play by turn four uh you're not playing a stacks deck <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> straight up no, I mean, Winota Win- could become a stack stack. Um, I think there's a lot of push for that right now once, like, Winota pilots started getting their shit removed and people started playing Grafting's Cages more often. Um, but, yeah, I-, I think we're a ways away from those sort of lists being fully finalized and ready for, like, uh, really high-level tournament play. Although, eh, prove me wrong, but, yeah. I, I know there's been a, little- a bunch of talk about, like, just playing the deck, whereas you're just playing, like, decent to good, like, stacks, like, uh, white red stuff and then just like you cast Renota on like turn 5 after deploying your hand uh, to get an immediate swing but yeah um, but I, I honestly I do feel like uh, for that game plan uh, Elevir might just be the better deck mm, that is true huh I, oh god I forget the exact wording it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's when she enters the battlefield or attacks you put an aura on another creature, and that aura right. is uh, the creature has 
um, plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control, and uh, and then she has whenever an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. Right. So you just dump out your stacks pieces, and then just uh, the fuel. Elevir yeah. just makes them big and also draws you more cards. And unlike Winota, you don't um, you don't have the sort of issue where in order to like enable the engine that is Winota, you have to put a bunch of stuff in your stacks deck that isn't stacks, right? Like you've got yeah, your isn't actually good. Your like combat juicers, and you've got your uh, like Winota triggerers. And so, just, like, the actual density of stacks effects in Winota goes down pretty precipitously. Mm -hmm. Quite quickly. Yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah, so I would say probably don't play Turbo right now in, like, large tournament metas. Obviously, all this is subject to change for your local meta, because local metas are very different from, like, large national level metas. Um, but, yeah. I would say don't bring Turbo unless you have, again, a really good read on the meta, or you're just a god and you always have turn twos and whatever, like, protected turn twos and turn ones and stuff like that, or whatever, I don't know. Or you just, like, found the broken, the secretly broken Turbo deck that inter that tries to win on an axis that people totally aren't prepared for. Yeah, just be better than everyone else yeah. and also lucky. And then... Yeah, that, that's what we're saying. Uh, and then, yeah, I'd say the... Sort of the last category here of things in the meta uh, is stacks. And uh, stacks is dead. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if stacks... I mean, stacks is like never fully dead, obviously. Um, you're probably still stacks, stacks doing fine. But uh, it's it's a struggle. I would not suggest bringing it to like any tournament right now. It's uh, It just doesn't interact favorably. It's like super hard to, especially in current games, like... The stacks that you need to put into play is to basically, like, stop people from drawing, even, because there's just so much good interaction for stacks now. Odawar and Besaidu are, like, death knells that people are drawing cards, because they just bypass everything that you're doing. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it feels really hard to get stacks online in a good enough time to actually, like, impact the game. <laughs> While also not, like, building your deck to be, like, Turbo Winota and just, like, dumping out a Rule of Law ASAP and then, like, having nothing going on until, like, you stick your commander three turns later or whatever. Um, and playing the slower stacks is just, like, you gotta be, like, in blue at that point. And I'm not sure that anybody has ever actually solved, like, the blue stacks build that works in, like, the history of CDH, honestly. I guess, like, post-Paris Mulligans, post, like, Partners printing. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, probably, like, Blue Pod was, is the closest we've come. Yeah. Um, but, like, even then, it's, has so much mid-range potential that it's, like, kind of hard to justify going, or, like, committing to full stacks. Um, and, yeah, there's, like, the problem is, is that a lot of these stacks decks sort of lack a good way to win the game and then when you have a good way to win the game it's like well why not just lean into that rather yeah, than yeah just just do that instead um and yeah it's uh, it's all very very awkward um and then yeah oh i guess we actually didn't I, i'm just looking at this list now i guess we didn't talk about sans black at all just like sort of an interesting case here um which, you know, like, yeah, let's talk about that a bit, because I think we also missed this last time we did this episode. Um, but Saz Black, interesting place to be right now, I think, honestly. Um, not bad. I think uh, green tutoring for Dockside, and especially playing creature-based combos, Dockside combos, makes up, for a lot of, uh, makes up for a lot of consistency issues that you sort of have from losing black. The issues that it doesn't solve are the losing Thoracal problem, and then also not having black makes your breach as much worse if you are on breach um just because you know d tutor for breach is very good when you have a stock graveyard later in the game and having to do that with gamble or e tutor instead is much worse even like a war gate can you even 
Yeah, because you can't work aid for a for um brain freeze, right? I mean, in theory, you can work aid for grinding station, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a <laughs> for on grinding station and Sans Black. I think we've gone astray. I don't know. Evo players at me or something. <laughs> Does Evo even exist anymore? <laughs> oh, they will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> um, what have but, you done? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel, so like, Sans, Sans Black is just Bruce Thras right now, right? Like, I I don't think there's not, I, I guess they're on Akiri Thrasios for like the truly fast stuff at the moment. I don't know. Weird spot. Definitely decent deck. What do you Obviously, mean? Are, are you suggesting to... that Omnath, Locus of whichever <laughs> I, one I, that is? I is... absolutely <laughs> am. I just, I, I'll be caught dead before I ever see fucking myself That's Locus playing of Omnath creation, or, right? or not writing Omnath correctly. Sorry? Or I'm, I'm I was like Omnath just trying to remember deck. which Omnath it was, and I'm pretty sure oh, it's yeah. Locus creation. creation. I think it's creation. Um, yeah, I yeah, Thrust Bruce is an interesting case right now because I think it definitely has potential in terms of like it has that thing going on for this meta where it's a mid range deck that still gets to play all the value engines. Like you still get to play all the really good stuff. You have a value engine in the command zone. You have good tutors for Dockside. You can still be explosive, and like the win cons are like can be surprisingly resilient. Um, having an infinite mana at the command zone sort of helps a lot with that for like ML Dockside. ML Dockside is like not particularly easy to interact with for a lot of decks. Um, you'd have to have removal and people aren't playing enough removal ever. So, you know, they die. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's probably still some work to be done there as well. I think there's maybe a bit of refinement, maybe not refinement, but also like exploration into new areas being like a bit less interactable, maybe like trying to like sort of switch up how you play the deck how you build the deck to be a bit lower on the interact or on the uh sorry threat assessment totem pole in a given pod without like necessarily giving up power but i don't know yeah it's all a uh, kind of a, a tricky balancing act yeah it turns out cutting uh cutting good color makes deck building worse <laughs> or harder at least definitely makes it harder who who could have seen this who could have guessed Anyway, so let's, uh, that's, I think that's, like, basically a roundabout view of the meta right now. Obviously, there's a bunch of rogue decks out there, and, uh, those people are still doing well. There's still, like, you know, new stuff at every tournament that doesn't fit into, cleanly into any of these categories. But this is sort of, like, the general categories the meta's at right now, instead of the positioning of a bunch of them. Um, so let's talk about how you attack it instead. Um, it, so you're going into a tournament, or you're, uh, sort of looking at the current meta, and you're like, well, there's... Obviously, there's a way to break the meta. No meta is ever stable. Uh, how do I do that? Um, and there are a couple of ways. Um, I think the big one that, like, almost no decks that are are playing right now that, like, they really should be playing. I think, like, exactly Tivit as the top tier decks right now are playing it is uh, Grafteer's Cage. Grafteer's Cage is really good, turns out. Uh, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> doesn't sound right. All right, so are we just Gra saying Gra that Gra it's Gage not worth insane. it to try and stop other people from, <laughs> other people from doing winning, stuff. and you should yeah. just do your own thing? And I think Cage is such a special case because of how, like, if you can play it, it's so low opportunity cost to play it, and it comes down so easily as a one CMC. Urza Saga tutorable. Um, colorless artifact that like it's how many how many times do you just like have extra colorless mana sitting around on turn one because you like fast mana and something out and you're waiting for turn two to do your like colored mana right it's like turn one off of soaring free turn one off of like a uh like mana crypt into like a two mana play or like mana crypt one mana play uh cage it's just like so free so free to cast it it deals with so much stuff i mean like shutting off breaches is super important um it like just insulates you into just having to worry about fast orca console which is you know way more easily deal with the if you don't have to like also like think about the threat of a breach coming down um and then also like just shutting off all the green decks is pretty great true really not bad yeah. <laughs> it's uh maybe not exactly what the meta needs but uh it certainly is a thing you could do yep i mean yeah it's uh i, I think it's an access to attack especially because we have brother runestone as well now and you also have um what's the god that uh jailer what is it uh soulless jailer uh, soulless jailer that's the one so we have you know there are there are a bunch of different versions of this effect now um and then when you pair them all with draneth which also gets breach doesn't get the green stuff as nicely but you know there's i think there's space there to sort of 
mess with how people are using uh, alternative zones to try to get an advantage and then just, uh, you know, cracking down on it. Yeah. I think you're... Uh... Uh... No, it's... Yeah, go for it. I think uh, there's, like, a lot of... Uh... There's a, there's a, I mean, some decks that could be running it or like potentially have like one or two effects that they could either just trim or, you know, play and just accept that there's that little bit of tension. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a card that like almost every deck is going to find like at least annoying. Yeah. Like maybe it's not like, maybe they can still win through it. But there's definitely, like, you know, there's something in their deck that it it turns off or makes really awkward or, you know, like, it could just be things like the Tabord Tutors, um, you know, Transmute Artifact if you're playing Weathered Runestone, like, people going for the One Ring. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess also, like, Draneth... Uh, doesn't hit all of the same stuff exactly, but uh, definitely hits some of it, uh, and that's uh, that's another pretty pretty good one. Yeah. That although that one's I... less of a deck building choice, and more of a I would say like a play pattern choice, just because like you should be playing Draneth if you're in white. <laughs> Basically, but the, per, right there around, are people but... who don't. It's yeah, that's yeah. Perplexing. I think you should but... definitely be playing Draneth if you have the ability to right now, and I think. Especially there are a lot of pods. Like, Dranith is one of those... Dranith is just, like, one of those stacks pieces where you don't even need to know what people are actually doing in their main deck. You can just look at the commanders and be like, oh, this is, like, a Dranith pod, and I can, like, mulligan for early access to a Dranith or, like, any number of X other effects. And then just... It can be so good when you have it on turn one so much of the time. Yeah. It's, uh... Turns out, this format where everyone gets cards that they're allowed to build around... Uh, you can kind <laughs> yeah. of mess people up if you Turning it into deny it them just, access yeah. to those cards. <laughs> um, I think you actually put this next one down, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh... Oh, the yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah so uh, a Torp Orb and and similar effects: uh, Hushbringer, Hushwing Griff, to a lesser extent, Stern Proctor, Takatli Honor Guard. If you're going deep. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, obviously we've uh, actually spent a surprisingly little amount of time talking about Thassa's Oracle this episode, but um, it's uh, I think its effects are well understood, and obviously Dockside uh, we have spent a good amount of time talking about, and uh, yeah, both of those uh, are stopped by effects that stop creatures entering the battlefield from triggering abilities. And uh, even decks that aren't entirely reliant on those effects are generally going to be annoyed, um, whether it's, like, Recruiters as Tutors or, like, Spellseeker, uh, Gilded Drake. There's just a lot of cards that, uh, like, similar similar to, to Cage, like, almost every deck's going to have something that that just yeah, really messes it. up for yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, trying to take advantage of that is uh, a pretty good idea. Now, the spicier one for this one, for the record, is uh, if you care too much about your ETBs, but you still want to hate out other people's ETBs, Abolith Spawn, baby. Hell yeah. <laughs> I didn't, unfortunately, neither of us got to play it <laughs> at a recent tournament, because um, neither of us could get our hands on it before a tournament, but you should definitely be testing with it, because uh, card's hilarious and sort of nutty. I had it played against me. Yeah, it's good, huh? <laughs> it blocked my Archivist of Ogma. I was very sad. Nice. <laughs> it, it didn't, the ETB didn't matter. It just was a flash blocker. I was like, oh. Yeah, but what else, what else could you ever want a, a stack piece for? I mean, honestly, if you're playing if you're playing creature stacks, um, 3 CMC flash is a pretty great place to be for, uh, for stacks effects, especially if you're in blue as well, which is uh, sort of necessity for playing the, uh, the card that we're talking about. I mean, yeah, just like anything, particularly with stacks effects, Flash solves sort of the issue we mentioned earlier of yeah. uh, you, you know, when you're playing these, like, proactive strategies, you have to commit to whatever it is you're doing ahead of time. And, 
So, like, if you have stacks pieces with flash, then, I mean, obviously, ideally, your entire... It would work best if your entire deck had your flash. Deck um, instance, yeah. But uh, just having some amount of flexibility uh, on, um, like, when exactly you are playing your uh, effects and, you know, the option to, like, potentially hold up removal if the stacks piece isn't right or counter spells if you're in the colors for them uh definitely does a lot to uh to alleviate that uh alleviate that problem yep um cool and then the last thing that i have here i feel like there's probably more ways to attack it but <laughs> i feel like we ended up being sort of low effort although i i would say cage and torpor are maybe not obvious uh solutions that people should be looking for um but i think the uh the other way to go here um, is sort of in a completely different direction, not like single cards, uh, which is to look for higher color commanders, three plus colors, um, that have uh, some amount of all of uh, resilient wind cons, um, a commander that produces value in a uh, probably non card based manner, although I'm um, certainly like still drawing cards is always a uh, great upside um, but a lot of the time uh, I think what I would be looking for right now is playing a highish color commander that is pretty decent on its own um, so isn't just completely dead in the command zone um, has a decent has like good resilient win conditions so not just like fast as oracle consult or breach but like um, something that's relatively efficient that sort of dodges a lot of the common interaction that people are playing right now and makes it harder to interact with and then sort of just taking that all and leaning more into main deck value engines again we're seeing more and more of these get printed over time they're sort of coming closer and closer to approximating the power level of rhystic study and fish obviously nothing quite gets to that point but at this point we have stuff like fish rhystic study Esper Sentinel, One Ring, Talion, Archivist of Ogma. We have a bunch of options for card draw effects and card generating effects that I think you can like sort of approximate, like almost approximate. We're not quite there at this point, but you can get pretty close, especially with Black in the deck, to approximating a uh, value producing commander by just playing a good density of these um, value engines in the 99. And I think that entire package put together is probably a really good direction to look if you're looking to play, you know, sort of something that's more in line with the generic um, meta stuff maybe you're not into like the lower color things too much or you just appreciate the card quality of like five color and four color piles um but just like looking for decks that are yeah maybe trading a bit in the commander power level objective like power level compared to like timna but making up for it a bit more in like resilient win cons again this is something like the um i'm i'm gonna find the name of that card but the uh cecily uh whatever um boros commander um uh, sans green deck where like you're playing like uh you sort of end up playing sort of like mid-rangey you're still drawing cards every turn with your commanders and then your win con is like a time sieve win con rather than uh going for fast oracle stuff which is a bit harder to interact with so i think that kind of direction is really interesting to look at yeah it's definitely uh doing something even just a little bit different uh is uh potentially yeah. very uh very powerful in the in the right circumstances and, uh, I mean, again, you know, as, uh, maybe as, you know, it's not, uh, like sexy or, or exciting, but, uh, just having access to a lot of colors means that you have access to a <laughs> yeah. lot of really good cards. And you can build your deck in a much wider variety of manners <laughs> to combat different metaphors. <laughs> yeah uh cool so let's um i think let's let's cap off the main topic of this episode and just talk quickly about our opinions on the overall health of the format right now um i think you know actually how about you take that because i feel like you have probably the stronger opinion and i can just tack on at the end um because i think i have an idea of what sure. you want to say about it um I, man i have the problem is i have a lot of conflicting thoughts yeah that's fair uh <laughs> I think that certainly the meta um, is not, like, it's not, like, hugely unhealthy. Um, I think that there are sort of some unhealthy aspects to it um, in, 
you know, some, some definitely some important and like well-defined ways. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it is sort of trending towards better. And most of those are just caused by, uh, cards that in my <laughs> humble <laughs> opinion, let's say, uh, please don't fact check that. Um, just really shouldn't exist um and yeah. as long as they do exist i don't think that we're going to get uh much healthier of a meta through like play patterns um i mean i guess conceivably we could hit a point where um uh, like one of the trends i have noticed is a lot of decks are trimming uh things like two mana mana rocks mm -hmm. um and so conceivably through uh a lot of effort we could hit a point where um like dockside isn't quite so dominant is <laughs> isn't um, as much of an issue yeah where like or at, at the least at the very least game. yeah yeah i think that would be like something that could potentially happen where um if decks that are playing I don't know, like, 18 artifacts sort of were more in, like, the 8 to 10 range, where, like, you still have most of the broken fast mana, um... But a lot of it is, like, like all, You run, use, like, all the like, mana positive stuff. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's, then, like, the Jewel Lotus in there, there's a Lotus Petal in there, as like, some of it's sort of expendable, and then, yeah. Yeah, um, I think we could, like, hit a point where, um... It was at least not consistent or less c consistent than Dockside on, like, turn, I don't know, three, just produces enough mana for if whatever you know, combo you those, might desire yeah. to assemble. Yeah. Um, but I don't... <laughs> I'm not gonna hold my breath for that. <laughs> yeah, def I definitely agree. Yeah, I think, uh... I think the unfortunate part of the current meta is that it's basically over-centralized around exactly fish for Stick Esper One Ring, um, to a lesser extent, Talion and Archivist of Wagma. Um, I think it would be much cooler if those cards didn't exist and we had a similar <laughs> meta where it was more based around what you had in the command zone and what you, you know, what you could cobble together out of uh, sort of, like, more commander-dependent value engines, because presumably if those cards didn't exist, or, you know, we cut down to maybe One Ring being the best value engine in the format, um, it might be more about like, oh, well, it's just more efficient to play things that synergize with my commanders more um, to produce those cards. But yeah, I think uh, I think I think I'm uh, I'm pretty happy given the cards that exist. I'm pretty happy with the current meta. Um, and there's enough space. I, I think like stacks probably need some help, but that's like a much more overarching issue, and I don't think it's like solvable in the context of like if metas shift enough stacks becomes viable i think that's a like a stacks doesn't have a good enough strategy or a good enough set of commanders to compete or like there aren't commanders that are compelling enough to build in a stacks manner um at high level play that like you know those decks are like really worth playing in a wide in wide scale terms um but i think yeah there's i mean there's a decent enough amount of variety in terms of what people can bring to tournaments right now you can sort of you can do a bit of leaning on the rest of the table for interaction i think in a large percentage of pods and sort of be a bit more greedy you can always try to like force wins through early because of that and i think it's yeah i, I think there's space and i think the the play patterns aren't like the absolute worst thing in the world that like these long positioning based games are much more preferable to me than like either than just like early game racing to do x and then just sort of like have the game play out from there like after you've made all your decisions and mulligans in turn one whether that be like turn one rule of law turn one try to resolve an ad nause even turn one rhystic study but the point being right now that like you know turn one rhystic study is good and like you're gonna get it but i think that a lot of decks have like good enough average draws they're not always going for that and that's like relatively healthy yeah that's fair Cool. Um, so I think unless you have anything additional to tack on there, that about makes it up for our uh, our primary topic. This has been a long one, but I think it was uh, probably well worth it. Let us know if yeah, you disagree. Uh, <laughs> definitely got into it. <laughs> yeah, 
pretty, hey, pretty which deeply. I think is uh, worth it for our audience, considering I think we've missed an episode or two at this point. <laughs> at, sure, at this yeah, point, this of the release is, schedule. Uh, so, uh, trying to make it up to y'all. Yeah. Um, cool. So let's uh, let's hop into um, listener questions. Unfortunately, we are skipping gut checks since we only have two people. Sag, blame Lyndon. Not our fault. <laughs> Don't actually blame Lyndon. He'll be on next one. Um, or will he? Uh, I mean, you could blame Lyndon a little bit. <laughs> you could blame Lyndon a little bit, actually. I will permit it. No harassment, though. Um, maybe a bit of harassment. No harassment. Um, <laughs> so we'll do uh, listener questions right now, and I think we're going to... Uh, I think we'll go with the first one that we have here and then uh, save one for later. Reminder for listener questions that we have channels on our Discord, um, both for the general public to submit questions. So if you have any question that you'd like to hear answered on the podcast, you can feel free to drop that one on our Discord. And for patrons, we have a uh, Patreon um, listener question channel where you get priority and we'll uh, try to either immediately answer it in the... uh, patreon uh general chat or we'll uh, answer it on the podcast basically asap uh so yeah let's go for this first one uh from fog shaper would unbanning grizzlebrand b- break cdh morgan thoughts uh no so i guess your i guess uh define your concept of break cdh and then reasoning <laughs> So I, I think that um, a, a long time ago, I did some tests of essentially, like, could a deck that, I think I was playing Kess, like, mid rangey Nas, whatever. Mm-hmm. And essentially, I was like, if I just reanimated a Grizzlebrand on turn one, could I win? And the answer was generally yes. Like, uh, drawing 28 cards, even with, like, zero mana and almost nothing developed was generally enough to win. Um, but, like, I think all of that sort of changed when, like, the Fire Nation attack existed. Um, where, like, the requirements for winning the game are already very low. Putting an A drop in your deck and then also, like, presumably Entomb, presumably at least a couple of ways to, like, discard... Um, and uh you know then like reanimate animate dead like all of that stuff um you know it, it does take a toll and so like i think that grizzlebrand would it would certainly be viable mm-hmm. um but i don't like when i think of breaking it i don't think it would be like comfortably the best deck and i don't think we would see decks like really stretching themselves to try and play it like i don't think mm-hmm. I don't think Timna Krom would go like, okay, I'm going to put in Entomb, three reanimates, like a Ghostly Pilferer, and a Grizzlebrand. Yeah. Like, and even play in play. place of Nas. Yeah. Like, I just don't think we would see stuff like that. Um, it would obviously be a nice leg up for, like, re- existing reanimator decks because it kind of covers, between it and Razaketh, it sort of covers the two bases really well, yeah. where, like, those decks have always sort of struggled with, okay, if Razaketh can't win, what is the, like, the best thing to just sort of put into play? We've seen Gigataxius, we've seen Villas, um, we've seen World Gorger Dragon in decks that had red. Yeah. I was um, about to say, I, I think it also cleanly, like, it cleanly bridges the gap as well, like, sort of in, like, the Sans White-ish or, like, five-color reanimator decks between, like, World Gorger and Hallbreaker Horror now, which I think is, like, a pretty good package but it's sort of missing like a good reanimation target i think like grizzle brand is really nice in the intermediary between those where it's like i don't have the rocks to win with a hallbreaker horror immediately and i don't have the enchantment reanimate to uh, get a world gorgeous dragon so i can just get like a grizzle brand instead or the or the creatures to win a or creatures yeah. to rest so like i think it would be good and would help those decks but i think those decks are in a relatively rough spot uh it also gets uh a little scary uh in a bowmaster world yeah um, definitely <laughs> turns out Nas that uh, gets bowmastered not great <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah so that's uh you know something you do have to be cognizant of but uh, like i think not that long ago it i would have said yes but uh, yeah now i would not i think uh i I would mostly agree. I think I probably evaluated a bit higher than you, but I, yeah, I, I think it's like 
probably unbannable at this point, especially just because, like, uh, I, I'm not actually, I'm not totally convinced that reanimator decks actually need the kick. Like, I do think, I do think the, like, sort of the density-based reanimator decks where, like, you know, like, traditionally the reanimator stuff is sort of, like, sans red or five color a lot of the time. You're trying to do, like, slower reanimation and just try to get, like, you know... You can do, either do, like, survival. Obviously, Entomb's always an option, but, like, you don't always have Entomb, and you're trying to, like, survival or, like, draw into it and discard it with, like, a some mid-range thing that also happens to be a discard outlet. I think there is space right now for, like, a density-based reanimator deck where, like, you have Entomb, but you also just, like, play four or five disc or, like, a reanimation targets and then, like, just, like, a bunch of, like, incidental discard outlets and, like, looting things and stuff like that, and just you're trying to just bin a winning reanimation target and get it reanimated as fast as possible just to be like a really fast deck. Um, and I think, I think there's still space there. I've done a bit of brewing. My decks are not that good, but like there, I am not totally sure how to build the deck anyway. So, you know, putting in like Grizz or, uh, yeah, putting in like a world gorger plus both ties power to tyrant and a uh, hover horror seems like a good start. But I definitely think Grizzlebrand is a sort of nice bump to those time kind of decks too, and maybe it's just like one of those things where the deck was already playable, but it just like needs an unbanned to get a kick in the or like a new print in to get like a kick in the pants for the people to go and start brewing it and playing it. Yeah, I just <laughs> I think the issue with Reanimator is not like one that is solved by having one more target or whatever. Well, no, just like. I, I don't know, like an, a 10 mana creature that just had, like, when this enters the battlefield, you win the game. You win, yeah. Would, uh, like, would be, you know, dumb. But, like, I don't think that would, like, make Reanimator a top tier deck. Right. Like, I, I think the problems with it aren't that what you reanimate isn't good enough at winning the game. Yeah. It's that you can't play 10 copies of Entomb. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out Entomb is like the best card in a con by a country mile for Reanimator, and only getting to play one, maybe two copies now, if you're on uh, on Mark Graves. So. <laughs> Funnily enough, I actually think it might have a much larger impact if Grizzlebrand wasn't legendary. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, like unironically, you'd, you'd, <laughs> yeah. you would get an actual second copy of Entomb in yeah. uh, in unmarked grave, which like helps a ton. <laughs> I think, like, yeah, I don't know, like, what's, I, I guess the extended uh, Entomb family right now is just, like, Entomb, Entomb, Unmarked Grave, Buried Alive, Intuition, and, like, that's it. And that's I guess Survival. Sort survival, of. sort of, yeah. It's, like, four mana. It's, like, the same as a Gerard's Orders. Yeah. Dr Dr yeah. <laughs> anyway. I mean, but you don't have to, you don't have to pay it all at once, which definitely helps. Yeah, yeah, it helps a bit. Um. Anyway, yeah, I think, uh. We will lock in it at no. Let us know if you disagree. Again, engagement on the Discord always helps out. Let us know uh, if you had anything about uh, that. But I think we are mostly uh, good to go on this episode, uh, which about wraps it up for us. Um, if anybody would like to reach out to us with any uh, questions, comments, or concerns, you can contact us on Twitter at Into the North Pod, via our email at Into the North Podcast at gmail.com, or on our Discord server, the invite link for which can be found in the description for this episode. And extra special thanks goes out to all of our patrons who help cover the expenses for our show and allow us to work toward improving the quality of the podcast. If you too would like to become a patron, we are at patreon.com slash Into the North Podcast, also linked in the description for this episode. Thank you, as always, to the band Vox Cadre for our lovely podcast music and to Nate Slover for our equally lovely podcast logo. Next episode will be out in two weeks. Until then, see ya. Bye.